Well, Romans chapter number 5, we're going to read here in just a moment. I, I want to preach on, on the text that we're going to read from. Uh, I, I titled the message this morning, Reconnected with God. Uh, reconnected with, with God. And, and hopefully by the time we're, we're finished this morning, uh, that, that title will uh, make a little bit more sense for us here in just a moment. Romans chapter 5, and let's read beginning inside uh, verse number 6 from the Word of God. The Bible says... For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet preventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Verse number 11, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Let's pray together this morning. Father, thank You so much for Your Word. and for Your Spirit that, that takes Your Word and effectually applies it into our hearts. I, I pray this morning that in this setting that none of us here would be merely hearers of the Word only. M may we today build upon the solid rock of Your Word. M may, may we take Your Word, the Bible this morning, as it is in truth, the very Word of God, and may we seek to build our lives on that solid foundation. And so when the wind of your judgment, the storm of your judgment falls upon us, that our, that our lives, that our house would stand because we're founded upon the rock. So make us doers of your word here this morning. Help us to understand what it must mean for us to be reconnected with you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, in Job chapter 25 and verse number 4, a man by the name of Bildad asked what I believe is the most important question that could ever be posed. Bildad asked the question, here it is. He said, how can a man be right with God? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? And I really believe that Bildad's question presupposes something that we all need to grab hold of this morning, and that is that mankind is not naturally right with God. Uh, we are, in fact, naturally wrong with God. Uh, nobody has always been right with God. Uh, nobody has always been a Christian. No one has always been saved. Uh, mankind does not naturally have the relationship that we ought to have with God. We are far away from Him naturally. We are uh, on the wrong side of the tracks, as it were. Uh, in the iconic words of Isaiah the prophet, uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. And we've turned everyone to His own way. And the idea of what Isaiah is saying is, is just that, that same truth, that, that we're not where we ought to be in our relationship with God. In fact, instead of living our lives God's way, uh, all of us have decided to live our own lives our own way. Uh, we're like Old Testament theocratic Israel. Now, we've done that which was right in our own eyes, and we expect God to put a stamp of approval on the way we've chosen to live our own lives. And, and that's not right. Uh, we are like peasants who have committed crimes against our king and have therefore become banished from both the king and his kingdom. And, and because of our sin, because of our crimes against the king, we are forced to live away from the king. Again, we are banished from his kingdom because of our sins. And because of this banishment from the king, we are eventually sure and certain to be immersed into the worst, most horrific, long-lasting experience of death fathomable. In fact, we would say that the punishment for our sins is even beyond our wildest imaginations. The question of Bildad then is absolutely appropriate this morning. How then can a man 
be right with God? I would, I would maybe just kind of reconstruct that question this morning for our text. And I would ask it maybe this way. How can we be reconnected with God? How can we as, as mere peasants of a kingdom who has violated the commands of our king and therefore of his kingdom ever hope to become citizens again of that very kingdom? How can you and I be reconnected with God? Well, this is known as the doctrine of reconciliation. And it is exactly what the Apostle Paul is dealing with at length inside of the text that we just read from a moment ago here in Romans chapter number 5. Uh, this is uh, uh, the doctrine of reconciliation, being reconnected with God, it is what you and I desperately need. And, and some of us have actually experienced this. Uh, we were born away from God. We have lived away from God. And we desperately need to be reconnected with God. And, and praise the Lord, some of us have been reconnected with Him, yet still others of you may need to be reconciled or reconnected uh, with, with God. And so I would say this morning at the outset of this thing, in the imperative, you must be reconnected with God. If you want to evade the judgment of God, if you want to escape eternal hell fire, then, then you must be reconnected with God. Uh, in, in the words of Jesus, you must be born again. Uh, you have to be reconciled to your Creator if, if eternity is going to fare well for you. And, uh, and so that's what we're going to look at this morning. Uh, un under the heading of being reconnected with God, we're going to look at, at really three truths uh, connected with reconciliation. Uh, first of all, we're going, to, we're going to see our need to be reconciled. And then secondly, we're going to, we're going to see what it is that has been done uh, for us to be reconciled. And then the last thing we're going to look at this morning is the joy that comes from being reconciled this morning. And so that's the, that's the streets that we'll be driving down together uh, this morning. Number one, if you're taking notes, you want to jot down uh, the need of reconciliation. The need of reconciliation. The apostle here in Romans chapter 5 first undertakes, I believe, the reason why we need to be reconciled. And so let's start with, with the definition of this thing, okay? Uh, a basic understanding of the term reconciled or the action of reconciliation simply means to put back together, um, to, to be reconnected. The expression assumes that, that something has been pulled apart from something else. And because something has been pulled apart from something else, it is in desperate need to be put back together with or reconnected. Well, in Romans chapter number 5, now, we have been pulled apart from God. And the need of reconciliation becomes apparent because we are separated from God, because we are disconnected, because we are pulled apart from God, and therefore we need to be reconnected with God. And I think the first question really that kind of sprouts out of this is why are we separated from God? Why aren't we just connected with Him naturally? Right off the bat, why, why would we assume that, that there is this uh, disconnection from God. Well, the Bible tells us why it is that all of humanity is naturally apart from God. Uh, Isaiah chapter 59 and verse number 2, the prophet says that it is our iniquities that have separated between us and our God and have hid, as it were, His face from us. It, it is our sins this morning, not, not, not just the way you dress, not just the way you look, not just necessarily your attitude or your overall disposition, but, but it is our sins and our iniquities that have caused this great chasm between us and God that has separated us from the Lord and that really keeps us at bay from Him. Our sins not only separate us, but they, but they make it impossible for us to, to bridge the gap. It, our sins make it impossible for us to get back to where we need to be at. Well... Our separation is seen in two ways. We've already mentioned kind of generally speaking these two ways, but I want to make sure that we, that we have these in our, in our minds. Our separation is seen in two ways. Number one, uh, we are born separated from God. Now, the Bible says, Psalm 58, verse number 3, David, David says, the wicked are estranged from the womb. Uh, uh, meaning, uh, again, that, that you haven't always been right with God. 
I haven't always been right with God. No one has always been right with God. No, no we are estranged from, from the moment of our conception. There is this disconnection from us and God. And th- this shows our inherited sin nature. That all of us have inherited the guilt of Adam's sin. 6,000 years of consecutive human history and, and every person inside of those 6,000 years has all been guilty of sin because of our forefather Adam. Uh, this is, uh, again, our inherited uh, sin nature. In theological terms, Adam stands as our federal head. We all stem from him. And, and so it, it, in, a, in, a, in a simplistic way of looking at it, it's like the President of the United States declaring war on another country. And because the president declares something, then we are at war with another country because he speaks in a certain sense as our federal head. And so what he decides, uh, what, what his actions are, uh, affect the rest of us, right? And, and so in that sense, as, as Adam in Genesis chapter 3 violates the command of God, breaks the law of God, and therefore sins against his Creator, um, we were considered to be in his loins. We are connected with Adam. And so what Adam did, that, that curse, that guilt is passed down through every man that is born of a natural birth through 6,000 years of human history. There's not one person that this guilt has not touched. In, in our modern day, we call, it, we call it being guilty by association. All right, If you're with someone who does something wrong, then you're just guilty by association. You're just guilty for being part of the group. You are, and in those terms, you are born separated from God because you're associated with Adam. Now, now we don't like that. We don't like being considered guilty for something that we may or may not have done in our own rationalization just because we're associated with someone. And so in a court of law today, if, if you were just with someone who did something wrong and, and you were apprehended as well, you may stand up in your own defense. And you may say something to the effect of, you know, wait a minute. You know, I didn't do anything. I was just with him. I, I haven't done anything. And, and that's, that's a possible way for you to offer a defense on, on your behalf if you'd like to try that route. And, and if you were to do that, if you were to be accused of being guilty by association, and you were to say, hey, wait a minute, I haven't done anything, what, what the court is going to decide is to look into your life and to see, is there any evidence that you shouldn't be punished for the crime? Which brings us to the second way that our separation is seen. Not only are we born separated, but we have earned our separation. Well, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse number 23 that all have sinned and therefore come short of the glory of God. We have missed the mark of perfection. We have not hit the, hit the, hit the bullseye where we needed to hit it at. And so we're, uh, we're, we're separated because of our sins. Proactively, we have done something. We're not just guilty by association. We are guilty by our performance, by what we have done. And so once the examination is made, there would be ample evidence, more than sufficient evidence found that we have sinned and therefore our separation from God is entirely appropriate. We have violated the commands of an almighty God. And, and here's, the, here's the news of the century. Uh, God's not winking at sin. Uh, God's not passive in regards to sin. He's not okay that, that you and I have sin. No, no, in fact, the very opposite is true. God is immensely concerned with sin. In fact, the Bible teaches us that God hates sin. God hates sin so much that that the, the Word of God tells us that it is a stench in His nostrils. Well, he can't even stand the way it smells. Um, he, is, he is offended by our sins. In, in, fact, in fact, the Bible uh, tells us that such sin makes God sick at His stomach. Well, Habakkuk tells us in chapter 1 and verse number 13, speaking of the Lord, Habakkuk says that God is of purer eyes than to behold evil and that God cannot even look on iniquity. Sin is so repulsive in the eyes of God. Sin is so bad to the character of God that that not only does it stink to Him and 
And not only does it make him sick to his stomach, but God can't even stand to look at it. And you and I know something of that language, don't we? We've, we've, we've watched things on television or seen things come across our smartphone or, or maybe just in, in personal contact, we've seen things and we've quickly turned away from them and we've said something like this, well, I can't even look at that. Well, I just can't even look at that. Well, well there's, there's the idea of God with our sin. He can't even look at it, let alone be in its presence. Well, one preacher said it like this, God kicked the first rebel out of heaven and he's not about to let another one in. Um, uh, God hates sin. Uh, all sin. There, there's not, in that, in that relationship, there's not varying degrees of, of sin in, in that notion. No, no, God hates all sin. He hates embezzlement as much as He hates the white lie. Uh, he, hates, uh, he hates what you look at on your smartphone that you shouldn't, just as much as He hates uh, the full action of adultery. God hates all sin and is of pure eyes. He is too holy. God is too righteous. He is too perfect to even look at sin. And so, fast forward, Jesus is on the cross, and He is dying on our behalf. And one of the statements made from the cross, Jesus will say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that moment, uh, the sins of the world were imputed on Christ, on, on the Christ. The guilt of the sins of the world were imputed on Christ so much that the Father, in, in some way that, that I'll never be able to fully explain, the Father turns away from the Son because of what Habakkuk says, He cannot look on iniquity. Well, our sin is not God's fault. And therefore, our separation is not God's fault. God has never moved. He remains consistent. It's like the, the one boy asked the other boy. The one boy asked the other boy, well, where's God at? And the, and the, uh, and the other boy replies to the one boy and says, well, I guess He's where I left Him at. <laughs> and, uh, and that's right. God hadn't moved. I mean, He's where we left Him at. His standard hadn't changed. God hadn't deviated from, from His position. God is holy. He always has been holy. He always will be holy. What the Bible says about Jesus in Hebrews 13, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Old Testament prophet Malachi declared on the behalf of God, I am the Lord, and I change not. God is a consistent God. He remains consistent. It is you and I that have moved away from God because of our sins. We are, we are like the chaff which the wind drives away. We, we blow every which away. I mean, we're, we're here today and, and gone tomorrow. We're, we're religious on a Sunday and blasphemers on a Monday. We are like the chaff always in our lives. We are, we are pushed further and further and further from God because of our own sinfulness. And I think there's a, an element here where we actually feel that separation, don't we? Uh, don't, don't you feel that, that when you sin, that, that there's this space that's being made between you and God? Even as believers, we, we experience this this familial separation sometimes from God um, where, where we know that our prayers aren't being answered. They're being hindered. Where we know our relationship isn't right with the Lord. We, we sing the song in our, in our songbook, Nothing between my soul and the Savior, not of this world's delusive dreams. But sometimes, even as believers, we have things kind of come between us and the Lord and we feel that chasm. Well, well as an unconverted person, as a low sinner here today, that, that chasm is never shortened. It, it, is, never, it is never closed up. But, but the, the span between you and God only increases larger and larger and larger. You're being driven further away from God with every sin. Well, this is the picture that the Apostle Paul begins with inside of our text. In fact, he's already dealt with it in the first three chapters of the book of Romans. If, if you want to go back with me to Romans chapter number 1 just briefly, I'd love for you to see this inside of your Bible. In Romans chapter 1, uh, Paul is going to get to a certain point here where he, he kind of traces the progression, you could call it the evolution of man, or really the devolution of, of man, where, where mankind just generally gets worse and worse and worse. 
He doesn't get better and better. Uh, and so Paul deals with this natural progression. If you'll pick up with me inside of verse number 21, the Bible says, "...because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened." Uh, Paul just simply says there were some individuals who were apathetic in their knowledge of God. Well, sure God exists. Sure God's there. Sure we believe in God. They, they believed there was a God. They just didn't care to bother with God. They were not appreciative of His goodness to them. In simplistic language, verse number 21, this crowd just simply took God for granted. Oh, He's there, and when I need Him, I'll call upon Him, but other than that, I'm just fine living my life. Well, the progression down to verse number 23, we find out this same crowd begins to manipulate the idea of God. They change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and forfeited beasts and creeping things. They, they manipulate the idea of God. They use their imagination to make a God into something less than He really is. A God they can be comfortable with. A God that is okay with their behavior. A, a God that is, uh, that is passive to their sinful lifestyle. That's okay with their lifestyle choices. Well, it continues, verse number 25, they eventually begin to care more about creation than their Creator. They begin to care more about the pleasures of life than the person responsible for, for their existence. Paul says they not only change the truth of God into a lie, but they begin to worship and serve the creature more than the Creator. It, it's all about me. It's nothing about God. It's about my pleasure. It's about my satisfaction. It's about my life, the way I want to live. What's my agenda? What's my goals? What's my plans? What do I want to achieve? Who is God? And so they, they continue. Well, finally, by the time you get to verse number 28, this same crowd who just, mind you, simply started off being sort of apathetic towards God. There's a crowd that just stopped reading their Bible. There's the crowd that just thought Sunday night service wasn't that important. There's the crowd that didn't have time to pray. There's the crowd that, that, that took for granted the commandments of God. Eventually, that crowd winds up in verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. What, what does that mean? Well, they arrive in a frame of mind where they just entirely suppressed the idea of God's existence altogether. It, it became easier to deny Him and His existence than to keep making up excuses as to why God was okay with their lifestyle. Well, maybe you're here this morning and you say, wow, I would never get to that point. Well, you probably at one time thought you would never get to the point where you're at today. But here's the natural progression. Um, and, and really, it hadn't even stopped in Romans chapter number 1. Because of that, because of verse 21, 23, 25, and 28, you arrive in verse 29. Where Paul says, being filled with all unrighteousness. The word unrighteousness there, if you have that in your Bible, you might want to underline that. There's the blanketed term for everything else that proceeds after it. That these individuals become filled with all unrighteousness. What kind of unrighteousness? Well, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, and the list just goes on and on and on. And what, I, what I'd like to point out here is that these individuals are, are not committing these acts in isolation. It's not just every once in a while they, they do something that they shouldn't do. No, Paul says when, when you get on this road, you eventually wind up in a place in your life where your life is consistently filled with these so, sorts of behaviors. This isn't the, the occasional slip up. This isn't the I had a moment of weakness and I failed no, this is where you arrive at a place in your life where you're making provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You live to drink in iniquity like water. And, and this is just chapter 1 of the book of Romans. It's a bad picture that the Bible paints about humanity. And it's an accurate one. It is right on point. Well, back in Romans chapter number 5, Paul picks up on this same theme of how far from God man has really drifted. And he first deals with, inside of verse number 6, what we would call our inability. If you look at it with me there, verse number 6, 
Paul says, for when we were, here's, a, here's where I want to pull you into, without strength. When we were yet, underline that or make a note of that, without strength. The, the two words there are an expression translated from the word asthenes in the Greek. And it literally means strengthless. It, it refers to a person who is helpless. To a person who, as Paul says, just has no strength. He is without strength. The, the same word asthenes is translated as impotent in John chapter 5 and verse number 7. And in John chapter 5, this same word asthenes, without strength, is used to refer to a man who has laid beside a pool called Bethesda. Remember that? And he's laying there desiring some man to come pick him up, tote him over, and sit him down inside of a pool of water. And he's waiting for some man to do that for him because he cannot do it for himself. He can't even crawl fast enough. He can't get to where he needs to get to. He has to have someone come along and do it for him. What's the idea? Well, in John 5, the man at the pool of Bethesda is without strength. He's a helpless man. And therefore, he becomes totally dependent on someone else to help him. He can't do it for himself. Well, the description of our inability here is very strong. And we don't need to miss this. When Paul comes to verse number 6, talking about our sinfulness, our depravity, how far away from God we really are, the picture that Paul is painting is not that you and I have just simply missed the bullseye. No, Paul's saying you didn't even have enough strength to pull the bow back. It's not that you missed the shot in basketball. It's that you were too weak to even shoot the shot. You haven't even gotten started. Paul says. Well, Paul, Paul is saying it's not that you just didn't have enough righteousness. It's that you had none at all. Uh, the, the, the meter's not even registering. The, the gauge isn't even moving. You didn't even get started in the direction of righteousness. You're like the man, and I'm like the man, naturally laying at the pool of Bethesda. Someone is going to have to do this thing for us. Someone has to give us righteousness. Which is what Martin Luther referred to by his expression, an alien righteousness. What, what he was meaning is that you and I can never be good enough. Uh, the, the chasm, the, the, the gulf, the separation that you and I have experienced, both by uh, our inherited sin nature and our proactive sinful behaviors, is, is too much for us to ever close up the gap. We can never reconnect ourselves with God. We can never become righteous enough. In fact, all of our righteousnesses, Isaiah says, are like filthy, putrefying rags in the eyes of God. We're not strong enough. We're helpless. We are weak. We are without strength. And so someone is going to have to come along and do this thing for us. Someone is going to have to give us the kind of righteousness that God will accept. Someone will have to reconnect us, put us back together with God. Well, that's our inability. We can't do it ourselves. Secondly, Paul deals with our condition inside of verse number 8. Paul says, well, God committed His love toward us in that while we were, here, here's, the, here's the two words here, yet sinners. We were yet sinners. What, what does that mean? Well, well, it means that you and I are those who have broken God's rules. God said, don't do this, and we did it. God said, do this, and we didn't do it. God said, do not use my name in vain. And what have we done? Well, well, we've made up a curse word to include His name. In fact, we have drugged His name through the mud to the point that we now use in text messages an abbreviated way to use His name in vain. We'll, 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 we'll text OMG because we're, we're too apathetic to even go full length and take His name in vain. His name means so little to us, we just abbreviate it. God said, do not lie. And we've told thousands of lies. God said, you shall not worship anything but Me. And yet the majority of us have been guilty of worshiping everything else under, under the sun except for God. Uh, we worship recreation. Uh, we worship money. We worship our families. We worship our relationships. We worship our health. 
et cetera, et cetera. There's, I mean, we put everything in the place of God. I mean, people put laying down on a couch watching television before they put the very God that gave them life. That sort of thing is more important to individuals in our day and age. And, and those sorts of topics, the, you know, sports, ball games, television, vacations, recreation, our, our health, gym memberships, whatever it is, those things have become the priorities of our lives. That's what we mean by worshiping them. If we had to decide in between reading our Bible and doing one of those things, well, the majority of society would do the other thing rather than go after God. If we had to decide between spending time in prayer and doing something else, well, the majority of society would choose to do something else. Those are the priorities of our life. They are performed in the place of corporate worship, in the place of Bible reading, in the place of prayer. We are sinners. We have violated the commands of God. Uh, who can number His transgressions, the book of Job asks. Who can count how many times it is that we have really violated the commands, the expectations of God that He has placed upon us. No, no, we're sinners. And Paul highlights that inside of verse number 8. I mean, I mean, if Paul had a, had a yellow highlighter, uh, verse number 8 would be highlighted right there. While we were yet sinners. And so, we're separated from God and deserving of the wrath of hell itself. And there's nothing we can do about it. Well, Paul's not finished looking at our need for reconciliation. We're, we're, there, there's this inability on our part. Um, we, we can never fix it. There's our relationship. Uh, or or there, there's our uh, condition. We're sinners. And then thirdly, there is our relationship. Paul, Paul addresses our relationship down inside of verse number 10 where he actually refers to us as the enemies of God. And that's the exact word that Paul uses in verse number 10. He calls us the very enemies of God Himself. In our lost and natural condition, people are not just a little off track. That's, that's, what we, that's how we love to explain it, isn't it? Well, that's not true. Uh, mankind is not just a little off track. We're not just a little misguided. Uh, we're not just confused souls. We're not just in need of a little help. No, no, Paul is saying we are the enemies of God, meaning we are in absolute stark opposition to God Himself. We are fighting against God. The, the word enemies is indicative of hostility. We're not just talking about a, a, a UNC fan versus an NC State fan here. No, 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 we're talking about two opposing nations going to war against each other. We're talking about fighting and hating uh, one another. That, uh, God considers us in our natural estate to be His enemy. We're on the wrong team. We're wearing the wrong colors and God's wrath is aimed in our direction. I, we have such a hard time, I think, grasping that because the love of God has been so shoved down our throat. And we just presume that, that God is hovering over us and and, and patting us on the back with His hand and whispering to us, you know, everything's going to be okay. Well, that's not what God's doing. In fact, in Psalm 7 and verse number 12, David makes this daunting statement about the sinner's natural relationship with God and what the consequences of that natural relationship are. In Psalm 7 and verse number 12, David says if he, speaking of the sinner, or, or speaking of God rather, if God does not turn, he says... If he turn not, if he doesn't change, if, if something dramatic doesn't happen here, David's saying, God is going to wet his sword. The word wet, W-H-E-T, is, is a word that means to harden as if to sharpen. He's going he's gonna to slide his sword across the rock and make sure it is sharpened. If something doesn't happen in your relationship, naturally speaking, with God, God is readying his, his, his sword. And he goes on, he says, He hath, God has bent his bow and made it ready. David's saying in your natural relationship with God that God is actually readying himself to kill you. He's not, he's not your bud. He's not just a man upstairs. He's not just some figment of your imagination. No, no, he is considered your enemy. And He considers you to be His enemy. You are at enmity against God. The carnal mind is at enmity 
with God. You're opposing forces. And David says, God has already put the arrow on the string and He has put it back. You are condemned already. You are under the wrath of God and headed for eternal destruction. You're not just on death row. You're inside the death chamber. The gas is already pouring in. And so we see this morning our need to be reconciled to God. That we are separated from Him because of our sins. So what could be done to reconnect us with God? Well, number two this morning, if you want to jot it down, we'll look at the work of reconciliation. The work of reconciliation. But by the, by the expression, the work of reconciliation, we mean what is it that was done to bring us and to put us back together with God? So far we've just seen that we're pulled apart from God. But, but what is it that has already been accomplished that can bring us and put us back together with God. Well, this work of reconciliation, of being reconnected with God, is pointed to throughout our text. In verse number 6, you'll see the expression, Christ died for the ungodly. In verse number 8, Christ died for us. Verse number 10, by the death of His Son. We're reconciled to God Because Christ died for the ungodly. Because Christ died for us. Because of the death of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the death of Jesus Christ that is set as the basis of our being put back together with God. His death, that Paul is saying, the death of Christ was actually in our place. He died for us. Literally, inside of verse number 8, God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, here's the expression, Christ died for us. In our place. You, you, could, you could insert yourself there. Christ died in my place. He suffered the death. He suffered the consequence. He suffered the punishment that was meant towards me. The anger, the wrath, the punishment that was meant for us. Because of our sin, the arrow of judgment that was to be shot at us as God readies His bow, as He puts the arrow on the string, as He pulls back and He launches the arrow of His judgment, instead of the arrow sticking in us, He hit Christ on the cross. He absorbs the wrath of Almighty God. The consequences of our sin landed on Christ. Well, later on in this very same epistle in Romans chapter 15 and verse number 3, the Apostle Paul is going to quote from Psalm 69. And in quoting from Psalm 69, here's what, he, here's what he says. He says, The reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Psalm 69 is a messianic psalm. And, and the notion of it is the Messiah, Jesus Himself, is speaking. And, and He's saying... The reproaches of them that reproached you fell on me. Those guys, us, the sinners, reproached God the Father. We did that in that we took His goodness for granted. We lived our own lifestyle. We decided to live our own life. We took God for granted. We suppressed the idea of God. We manipulated the notion of God. And eventually, if something doesn't stop us in our journey, we will eventually get to a place where we just don't even consider the existence of God at all. And we will be filled with all unrighteousness. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, backbiting. We'll become haters of God, haters of good, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. All of that is in our direction. We have reproached God And in retaliation, God is set to reproach us. And so Jesus says, the reproaches of them that reproach thee hit me. Your judgment fell on me in their place. Here's how Isaiah says it. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement to bring about my peace fell on him. In my place. God's law has been broken. Justice must be served. God's wrath must be executed. It has to be poured out. And so it was on Jesus in the place of all those who have placed their faith 
in Him. We see several things here by way of the, the work of reconciliation. Number one, we see the author of this work. The author is God Himself. I think sometimes we blur the theological lines here and we have a tendency to picture God the Father as being mad and wanting to send everyone to hell and, and Jesus being the nice part of God where, where He just wants to save everyone. And so we produce this contention in the Godhead. Nothing could be further from the truth. There is no contention in the Godhead. The same God, I think this is the beauty of the Gospel, the same God who is drawing back His bow has also made a way of escape. The same God who has bent to destroy us has also made a way where He can accept us. Redemption, therefore, is the plan of God. It was formulated by God the Father. It was enacted by God the Father. And it is accomplished and has been accomplished for God the Father. In verse number 8, it is the Father who demonstrates His love toward us. It was God who commends His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John poses it down from the lips of Christ, John 3.16. It was God the Father who so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. It's God the Father's plan. He, he is the author of redemption's plan. He demonstrates His love to us. And according to Jude, verse number 24, Christ is going to present us to God the Father for His glory eventually. He has saved us to showcase His own glory. He sent His Son to die for us to reflect how awesome of a God He really is. And so there is no contention in the Godhead over the work of salvation. All three members of the Trinity are equally involved and in agreement with the total plan. One thing is for absolute certain. Mankind didn't come up with this plan. And there is no part of this plan that could have been executed and achieved by any of us. God is the author of salvation. Well, well then we see next the timing of this work. The work of reconciliation took place Again, if you'll notice inside of uh, verse, number, uh, verse number 8, God commendeth His, commendeth His love toward us in that while we were, here's again those two words, really the one word, we were yet sinners. We were yet without strength, Paul says. Yet without any hope in and of ourselves. Verse number 6, when we were yet without that strength. The word yet inside of verse number 6, Eddie in the Greek is actually at the beginning of the verse in the Greek text. And, and what that shows us is there is a, a stressing over the time factor of when all of this actually takes place. God didn't love you and Christ did not die for you after you had improved yourself. God wasn't and is not waiting for you to change certain, por certain portions of your life in order for Him to start loving you and to do something good on your behalf. No, no, you couldn't improve yourself. Right. You didn't do anything to merit this salvation. You didn't take the first step toward God. You, you didn't take the first ten steps. You didn't take half a step in God's direction. No, what Paul is saying in verse 6 and in verse number 8 is that God loved you and Christ died for you when you were at your weakest point, spiritually speaking. When you had no righteousness when you couldn't pull the bow back, when you couldn't shoot the shot, when you couldn't get yourself into the pool, when you had no righteousness in and of yourselves, God loved you and Christ died for you. There's the beauty of it all. There's the resounding magnificence of the Gospel. That some people think they've got to fix their life up. They think I've got to clean my life up before God's going to love me. No, that's a fool's errand. That's a fool's errand. You, you cannot help yourself. You're too weak. You'll drown in the middle of the ocean of God's wrath. The fact is, again, God loved you and Christ died for you while you were yet a sinner. From verse number 8. Again, that's the beauty of the Gospel. And, and, and the beauty continues, really. Paul begins inside of verse number 7, just pointing out the fact that a mere man, a mere mortal, sinful, corrupted, depraved man might die for a righteous person. But God's love goes so far beyond natural humanistic love. God's love reaches beyond that point and Christ dies not for the best of people, but He dies for the worst of us. And Paul is just 
in Romans 5 screaming that point to us. You cannot earn it. You can't even contribute to it. It, it was done before you even cared about it. This is God's plan. It's enacted by God for God's glory. Well, well the, the third thing we see here under this heading is the effects of the work. And so let's, let's get it all kind of straight here, okay? We have sinned. We are separated from God. We deserve the wrath of God. God decided to love us and therefore sent His Son to die in our place for us. The work of Christ is then applied to us by the means of faith, which is back inside of verse number 1 of our chapter, which means that we have trusted Him and what He has done for us. Verse number 10 begins with the effects of such a salvation of being reconciled to God. Verse number 10, we have been reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Because Jesus went to the cross, because God loved us and sent His Son to die on our behalf, because of that, we have been reconciled to God. Verse number 11 says much of the same. By whom Christ, we have now received the atonement. The word atonement at the end of verse number 11 is the same word for reconciliation. It is the word kataleso in the Greek. We have received reconciliation. We have received the atonement. We have received being reconnected with God by the death of His Son. Now again, reconciliation in a simplistic way is just putting something back together. Uh, the basic idea of the term is to restore a relationship that was previously severed, had been chopped in two, so to speak, which is exactly what Christ has accomplished for us in His death. But, but the term goes much further than just a, a reconnection of a, of a relationship. We're not just talking about two people who are at odds who are now just on speaking terms. No, no the term kataleso, reconciliation, encompasses an entire change in the relationship. In, in other words, when you sit down at the table of God, you're not some unwanted guest. Uh, you're not some unwanted peasant who just sits down and everybody looks over kind of weird at wondering, what in the world are you there for? No, no, no. when you're reconciled to God, you're no longer an enemy. You're no longer an outsider. You are now received as a beloved family member and you have a rightful place at the table of God. You sit down and enjoy all the benefits of being a member of the family of God. Paul says it like this in Romans 8 and verse 15 through 17. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself, Paul says, bears witness with our spirit that we are not just the friends of God, not just the acquaintances of God, but Paul says we are the children of God. And if children, then we're the heirs. And heirs of God. And joint heirs with Him that we may be also glorified together with Him. We are as reconnected with God as we could possibly be as if there was never any disconnection that had ever taken place to begin with. The word kataleso in ancient writings was used often of a married couple who had separated from each other. But through the work of a mediator, they have now been joined back together. They have been reconciled. Therefore, the feelings of hostility have been exchanged for love and acceptance. Well, Paul uses the term, he goes on to use the term in verses 9 and verse number 10, the term is justified and the term saved. The word justified speaks of God declaring the believer to be perfectly righteous, although we are not perfectly righteous. There's the alien righteousness. Because we're reconnected with God, we have the righteousness of God imputed to us, which allows, really, for that reconciliation to take place. God's righteousness, the righteousness of the Son of God, is placed on our account, which allows us to be reconnected. And therefore, we are said to be saved inside of verse number 10, the Greek word sozo, which means to be rescued. Literally, God has delivered us from hostility and rescued us, putting us back into the very family of God. We are the offending party. We are the sinners. We are the ones separated from God. But it is God that sought out our reconciliation. He left the 99 to bring us back into the fold he rescued us by the death and resurrection of His Son. And so just one more heading this morning. What is it that results from us being reconnected with God? So you jot down number three and we'll be finished this morning. The joy of reconciliation. The joy from reconciliation. In verse number 11, Paul really, I believe, reaches the climax of his immediate point. 
Verse 11, the natural response, I believe, of all that is going on before it. And what Paul is saying here is, it's not just that these things have happened in an intellectual showcase. This isn't just historical facts here. We're not, we're not, we're not just talking about mere facts, words on a page. It's not just that God loves us. It's not just that Christ died for us, Paul says. But we're excited that this thing's happened. <laughs> I mean, it's done something for us. This isn't just something that happened in some third world country. No, this is something that took place in my heart of hearts. This is something that has influenced my eternity. This is something that's changed my destiny. This has put me, translated me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son. This is a big deal, Paul says. We're excited. We joy, verse number 11. We also joy in God. Do you see that? We joy in God that this has taken place. I mean, this is the best thing Paul says. This is what makes me tick. This is why I get up in the morning time. This is why I preach. This is why I go on the journeys. This is why I'm shipwrecked and in perils and, and in nakedness and in, uh, I've been robbed and been beaten and been stoned and been in prison and all those things have happened to me because I just can't get over the fact that God has reconciled me to Himself. We joy in God. Uh, the, the word joy simply means, and you, you already know this, it simply means to rejoice. Paul says we rejoice, we joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the only reason for true rejoicing. Now I want you to get this this morning. The word translated joy inside of our Bibles in verse number 11 is a word that is also translated elsewhere in the New Testament as the word glory. And one of the places that this same word is used and translated as glory is in Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 14. Where Paul says, But God forbid that I should joy, that I should rejoice, that I should glory in anything save in the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Paul is saying in Galatians 6, 14, much of what he said in Romans 5 and verse number 11, that, that we have nothing else to rejoice about. We have nothing to boast in other than the fact that God loved us and Christ died for us. We have nothing to contribute. I have nothing to stand and brag about uh, concerning myself or what I have done. We, we could look at it from an opposite point of view. Uh, James chapter 4, verse number 16. James says, You rejoice in your boastings, and all such rejoicing, he says, is evil. Well, there's a crowd that thinks they've accomplished something. I mean, there's a crowd. I mean, they pop their galluses. I mean, they look like they're in. I mean, they're the Pharisees of old in, in, in new modern day clothing. I mean, they act like they're, they're the choicest of God's servants. And, and James speaks to such a crowd and says, You rejoice, you joy, you glory in what you can brag about yourself. And James says, All that kind of rejoicing is straight out of hell itself. It's evil, it's wrong, and it's sinful. And, and I got to think of this past week when I was studying, this, this just sounds like the way some people share their testimonies. I mean, the way they share their testimony makes them sound like they're the hero of their own story. I mean, they did this, they did that. I mean, because I came, because I trusted, because I prayed, because I made the decision, Paul said, I rejoice in what God's done for me. I mean, if Paul was to stand up and just say, Preacher, could I share a word of testimony? He wouldn't say, I, I, I. He would say, Him, Him, Him. Look what He's done. We need more hymns like that. We need more songs that point to God's glory. We need more men and women to stand up and say, I want to, I want to talk about what the Lord has done for me. Well, inside of verse number 11, you have the source of this joy. It's God the Father Himself. He says we also joy in God. We owe everything to Him. We owe nothing to ourselves. We owe nothing to a denomination. We, we owe nothing to a, a, a board of deacons. We owe nothing to, to religion in and of itself. We, we owe nothing to an institution or to a building or to a name. We owe everything to God. Amen, amen. He's the source of our joy. Zechariah chapter 4, verse number 6. After, after the southern kingdom of Judah has come into the land and they're rebuilding everything that needs to be put back together. That They're facing difficult times. They're facing times of becoming lax. And, and the prophet stands on the behalf of God to remind the people that what all has transpired, their salvation as it were, 
is not of works. It's not by might, not by power. But the prophet reminds them, it is by the Spirit of the Lord only that these things have taken place. And so you have the source of joy. Secondly, you have the means of joy. That is that we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's only by what Christ has done in our place. What church membership can never do, what money can never purchase, what my own good works would have failed at, Jesus has done it all. And then lastly, you have the reason for joy. And Paul says, we joy in God. It's through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement, the reconciliation. But here's the reason why we sing, Paul says. Here's, here's the reason for the pep in our step. Here's the reason why we stand to fight the next day and the next day and the next day. It's because of what God has done for us through sending His Son to reconnect us with Himself. And this is the best thing that's ever happened for us. This is it. You know, I've got to be honest with you, I really don't understand the excitement that comes from the world at large. I, 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 don't, I don't get it. I, I don't understand what the world is so happy about. I, I, what, they want a championship? They got a promotion? They, they won the lottery? If you did, feel free to give. But I mean, the epitaph of the life of the unbeliever should read like 1 Corinthians 15, 32. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. I know there's moments in your life that it calls a smile to come to your face, even as an unbeliever, and they should. But those moments at best will fade away. They're just fleeting moments of temporary joy and happiness. Those moments fly away with no real lasting cause to rejoice. But on the other hand, the believer has every reason to rejoice. Not in his health, not in his position, not in his bank account, but for this one reason. <laughs> Our sins have been forgiven. Amen. Our names are recorded in heaven. There's, there's a place at the table of God reserved just for me. And, and when I sit down there, I find the welcome of all of heaven. Not because of what I've done, but because of what He has done for me. My sins are forgiven. The gap between God and myself has been entirely removed. I've received the reconciliation that I so desperately needed. I've been reconnected with God. So this morning we've seen our need. We've seen what God has provided for us to fulfill that need of being reconciled. And we see the joy that comes from us being reconciled to God. Jesus suffered in six hours an eternity of hell on our behalf. And if we were to condense the gospel message this morning into one verse, we could go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18. Peter says it like this, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, made alive by the Spirit. And so... We were lost and on our way to hell. We deserved hell. There's nothing we could do to escape that judgment ourselves. And yet God intercedes on our behalf. He sends His Son to suffer our hell for us, the consequence for our sin. He pays all that is due on our behalf. The, the, the question we close with this morning is how does what Christ has done for us become a benefit to me? And the answer to that from verse number 1 is the word faith. And Paul says you and I can only be justified by faith. That means that you come to a point in your life where you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You, you commit to Him your life, your soul, your eternity, all that you are. Repentance, submission, allegiance, Trust, dependence are all tied up in that expression faith. You just give to the Lord all you are trusting in Him and in what He has done. And in that moment, in that moment, in a practical sense, you are immediately reconnected 
together with God in, in, a, in a state where you can never become disconnected. Again, what could, Paul says in this very epistle, ever separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? And, and the answer to that as he works through all those contradictory statements is nothing. So effectual is the work of Christ on the cross that He seals you both for time and eternity. He puts something on your relationship. The Holy Spirit that can never be broken by the strongest forces of hell itself. Certainly not by any of us. And so when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you'll be able to say with the Apostle and and the rest of all saints from all ages, We joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom I have now received the atonement. That's the only way that you can be saved from your sins. Let's stand this morning for prayer.